afternoon, everyone. Welcome all to our webinar with a panel presenting GDPR and research one year on experiences from across Europe. My name is Vela van der Ende from the UK Data Service, and I present to you a panel of four experts on various aspects of GDPR and data protection. They will now each in turn present themselves. Hello, so my name's Scott. Um, I currently work at the University of East Anglia as a lecturer in business law, but prior to that, I worked for the UK Data Service where I headed up sort of data protection compliance within the archive itself and also went around providing training to researchers about the GDPR and how to um, process personal data under that. Okay, hi, my name is Oliver. I'm working for the Data Archive at Gezes in Germany and I'm in the data service section and I'm dealing with questions, legal questions, and especially on data protection issues for some 15 years now. This is what put me on the panel. Hello, I'm Anna Matta. I come from Norway, from the Norwegian Center for Research Data. I work at the data protection services in Norway and I have done that for several years. Hello, I'm uh, Marlon Dominguez. I'm from the Netherlands. I work as a DPO for Erasmus University in Rotterdam. We will start with a brief overview of GDPR. We won't go into too much details because we're assuming that the audience knows most of the basics about it. And then each of our panelists will share their experiences from each of their uh, countries. That will last about 45 minutes, we estimate. That will be followed by a question section. Various questions have already been submitted to us in advance that we will deal with, but please submit any other questions you may have um, via the question box in GoToWebinar. We'll try to get through as many of them as possible. There's quite a lot of people on this webinar. Um, any that we won't be able to answer, we'll post them with their responses later on on the CESDA website. But we'll ask you first some questions. Please respond. So have you processed personal data under the GDPR in the last year? Yes or no? There you see the response. And the next question, which legal ground did you use for this processing of personal data? And this shows the results. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to my panel. Okay. Hello, so I'm just going to give us a very brief overview of the GDPR, um, just to make sure we're kind of all singing off the same hymn sheet, for want of a better word. I should probably start off with a little disclaimer, that of course this is just kind of my view and interpretation and thoughts, it doesn't mean it's legal advice. So to begin with, the GDPR itself is an EU-wide data protection regulation that basically came into force just over a year ago now, on the 25th of May 2018. And it enables data subjects to have greater control over their personal data, whilst at the same time also modernising and seeking to unify European data protection rules across the member states. But it does allow member states in certain areas to make specific domestic provisions for particular aspects of the GDPR. And actually one of the areas of this is research. So we'll actually find there's differences in the way that member states have implemented that. And that's part of what this webinar is about today, is really looking at some of these differences and highlighting them to you and discussing what these are. The GDPR itself applies to what's known as personal data and data basically of living persons. So data which um, are of people that have passed away do not necessarily fall under the GDPR, but there may be other ethical reasons or other legal areas which protects them. Um, for example, in the UK, that'd be something like breach of confidentiality. Where does the GDPR apply? Well, it applies to uh, any basically data controller or data processor in the EU who collects personal data about a data subject of any country anywhere in the world. 
And it also uh, applies to data controllers or processes that are based outside the EU, but collect personal data on EU citizens. So for example, myself as a researcher in the UK, if I was collecting personal data on a participant in France, that would be covered by the GDPR. If uh, I was a researcher based in the US and collecting uh, personal data on participants, say in Germany, that would also be covered. An example for where the GDPR would perhaps not be covered would be if you had um, a Chinese-based researcher who was Chinese collecting data on US citizens uh, who were based in the US um, weren't in the EU. That would be a situation where the GDPR wouldn't apply. However, if that personal data was ever going to touch anywhere in the EU, then it would need to comply with the GDPR standards and requirements. Okay, so personal data, um, pseudonymized data and anonymous data. So the GDPR defines these for us. And basically, uh, personal data under the GDPR is any information that relates to an identified or identifiable natural person. Um, and they have a, a definition of this within Article 4. Uh, this kind of means things like names, addresses, date of births, online identifiers, political opinions. These can all form part of what is defined as personal data. The key thing to remember here is it depends on the context and the information we have and the circumstances. So to give you an example, we might think of a job title. Is this really identifying information? Well, if we have the job title itself on its own, then it's potentially not identifiable information because we might need something more than that, like a name or an area. However, there are some job titles, like the job title I used to have at the UK Data Archive, which was a senior research data services officer. There was no one else called that in the world. So that one piece of information would then allow you to identify a specific individual. So again, the key thing to really think about is the context and what information we have. And unfortunately, I can't say this will always be personal data because it kind of depends on the circumstances. We then have pseudonymized data, and this is personal data that can no longer be attributed to a specific data subject without the use of additional information. So probably one of the easiest ways to think about this would be as like a key. So we have a data set where we've given uh, participants pseudonymous names, different names, to mean they're not so identifiable, but we still retain a key which would link that so we can go back to the original individual uh, and identify them. So the thing is here, pseudonymized data, um, I think the term can be a bit flexible in the sense that what might be pseudonymized data to myself, if I have the key, could in theory, and this is in theory, actually be anonymous data to someone else who had access to it if they don't have access to the key. But of course, if that key was ever to be released into the wild, then that data which was classified as potentially anonymous to them could then actually become pseudonymized data and would fall under the scoping of the GDPR again. Anonymous data, so this is data that cannot identify individuals in any way. Um, basically, when we do anonymization, it should basically irreversibly destroy any way of identifying the data subject itself. Now, the working party group, um, which is made up of various um, data protection authorities from member states, have actually highlighted within their own guidance around anonymization that actually to create what they call truly anonymous data in practice can be incredibly difficult. And in actual fact, perhaps problematic. And this is something we're going to pick up, I think, throughout the project, uh, throughout this presentation, sorry, whether we can actually talk about the idea of truly anonymous data in itself. Okay, so the principles for processing personal data. Under the GDPR, there are now six principles, and you can see them on the screen. And what we've tried to do here is apply these actually to uh, research. So for example, the first principle is you process lawfully, fairly and transparently. So what this really means for us is that we inform the participant of what we will do with their data and then we process it according to that. The second is we keep the original purpose. And this is highlighted in black because under what's known as the research and archiving exemption, which falls under Article 89 of the GDPR, there's a little bit of flexibility in this and the fifth principle. And we'll talk about that in a minute when we come on to the next slide. But when we talk about keeping to the original purpose, in standard terms, that means we should collect data for a specific uh, and explicit legitimate purpose and, that, and then not process it in any further manner that's incompatible with those purposes. But for research, and if we meet certain requirements, we can actually use data which was collected for a different purpose. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We also need to minimise data size. So basically, the personal data that is collected should be adequate and relevant and limited to what is actually necessary. And then we need to uphold that accuracy. So the personal data itself should be accurate and kept up to date. 
We need to remove personal data when it's not needed or in use. Again, with the research and archiving exemption, we have some flexibility here. And then the sixth principle is around ensuring data integrity and confidentiality. And that's basically about protecting that data from unauthorized or unlawful processing. So things like accidental loss, destruction or damage. And we talk about using appropriate technical and organizational measures here. And I'm going to pick that up on the next slide. So the archiving and research exemption itself, I've got the quote from Article 89 here on the slide. I'm not going to read it to you. What are the key things we need to take out here? So there is an exemption for research and archiving where it's in the public interest, where it's scientific or historical research or for statistical purposes. And here uh, the GDPR takes a very broad definition of what is meant by scientific. So it captures things like social science research as well. And we can use this to permit us to keep data for longer. Uh, or allow us to process data in a different way. However, we must um, comply with uh, the kind of appropriate safeguards of this. So what are these safeguards? So the first is that data should be minimized. So basically we don't collect data that we do not need and we remove data that we will not need. Um, again, we're thinking very specifically here of personal data. We will pseudonymize that data or we will anonymize it. So when we think about this uh, for research purposes, it's often actually quite appropriate to anonymize the data. We don't need to work on the raw personal data underneath. We might just need that if we need to contact the participant back at a later date. So we could pseudonymize that. And then we need to use things like technical and organizational measures. So this will be things like, for example, encrypting the data, ensuring we have access controls in place. Um, we're not popping it up in the cloud where it's on an open cloud platform where anyone can access it. Uh, and for example, if it was paper based, we're not leaving the paper based personal data on a desk when we leave the office. It's in a locked filing cabinet, uh, those kind of things. So there are six grounds for the processing of personal data and we need to basically have one of these present. Um, and we're going to pick up quite heavily within our discussion around these later, because this is one of the areas where there has been quite a bit of divergence across the EU. You need one of these grounds there. So we've got the option of using consent of the data subject. We've got contracts, so where it's necessary for the performance of a contract, where there's a legal obligation placed upon the data controller, where it's necessary to protect the vital interests of the data subject, where it's carried out in the public interest or in the exercise of an official authority, or where it's in the legitimate interest pursued by the controller. For research purposes, there appears to be three primary grounds, um, and that would be in no particular order, that it could be consent, public interest, or legitimate interest. There are some research projects that will also use contract, but primarily there does seem to be three broad ones, and we're gonna pick up this discussion uh, in a little while, particularly when I look at the UK um, side of things. So data subject rights, there's a variety of rights. You can see these on the screen now. I don't plan on going through all of them, but they're rights that we just have to be aware that data subjects now have. They don't necessarily always apply in all circumstances. It will depend. Um, so there's not an absolute right, for example, to be forgotten. So if a data subject contacts you and says, I want to be forgotten, that you have to do that. It will depend on the situation, the processing ground and the circumstances. A couple that might not be so relevant to research would probably be things like the rights related to automated individual decision-making in profile unless your research is doing that specifically, or things like the right to data portability. So let's now have a little brief look at some of the experiences within the UK. Um, so what are the changes we've had? So we've moved from the Data Protection Act of 1998 to the Data Protection Act of 2018. And this is really where what they've actually done is they've updated the uh, old Data Protection Act to meet the new standards and requirements of the GDPR. Of course, because the GDPR is a regulation, it means that we don't actually need any implementing national legislation like we would if it was a directive. But the UK has used the Data Protection Act of 2018 to deal with the areas which the GDPR has allowed member states to derogate to and from. And one of the areas here is research. So, for example, when a UK researcher looks at the DPA, they all also need to read the GDPR alongside this. In actual fact, if you look at the DPA, you'll find that many parts of it quote directly or link directly out to the GDPR. In the UK, we've also gone from eight data protection principles down to six. But if you actually look at the old principles and look at the new ones, they capture and align pretty much over each other. And we still have most of the things there or they're in other areas of the GDPR. OK, so probably one of the biggest areas is of divergence across the EU that we're experiencing in the UK is the processing ground that's being used. 
So within the UK, there's been a very heavy push for the use of what's called public task or public interest in research. Um, to use that ground, you have to be a public authority. To find the definition of whether you're, you would fall under that, you have to look at the Freedom of Information Act and legislation there. And then you'd look at, based on that, you'd then use the charters and principles that your institute may have or uh, using other acts to qualify to use this, um, such as the Higher Education Act. Um, the UK itself, this is being pushed heavily from many of the research councils, including the ESRC and the MRC UK, and it's being pushed as the main method that should be used for the processing of personal data. Um, I perhaps stand out in my views in that, that I feel that this is perhaps in some cases public task would be uh, an appropriate method to use, but I think in others it wouldn't be. And actually I feel a better approach which should be considered and undertaken is actually a case by case assessment of what is the most appropriate processing ground to be used for a particular project. Now, sometimes that absolutely will be public task, but there may be other times where actually consent is a better processing ground or another one has to be used. So for example, if we're doing a joint research project with another data controller and they're a private entity, we couldn't use public task because they wouldn't be able to use that. So we'd have to use potentially a different processing ground. And we'd also want to consider things like if we were doing a collaborative project, particularly if it's across the EU, where many um, countries don't per se use public task, they might be using consent as the processing ground, and that could cause problems trying to use public task for consent. Another concern that I have with public task is that it actually automatically strips away a lot of the data subject's rights by its very nature. And if you remember right at the beginning when we talked about the GDPR, one of the key things about that was actually enhancing data subject rights. And I don't feel this sits so well with that. I do think we're going to probably see more information come out, particularly from the ICO and the research councils and others around this to provide further guidance. I think it can be very hard to align public tasks with research and ethical consent that we'd still want to gain that ethical consent particularly around the things like the right to withdraw how do you clearly explain to a participant that you're collecting the personal data on public task grounds and that you will store it and keep it but that they still have the right to then withdraw from the research ethically but you can still keep that data that you've already collected and they can't stop you doing that so i think there is a little bit of a jarring there which we probably need further guidance and advice about We've also had the opportunity really to revisit what we mean by anonymization. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, the complexities around truly anonymizing research data. Uh, and I think we need to reconsider what we determine, determine or call anonymous data in research. Um, so I've seen when I worked at the archive, many consent forms and participant information sheets, which basically guaranteed complete anonymity and that no one would be able to identify the participants from the data. I think that the GDPR really requires us to reconsider this and think what we mean here, because whilst these are admiral statements to make, in practice, as we all probably are aware, this can be very hard to actually do. So, for example, if we have something like an interview, whilst we can strip out some of the direct identifiers, such as the names and places and some of the indirect identifiers, there's likely to still be a life story within that interview that someone who's close to the participant or potentially knows them could lead to their identification. And particularly if we've made some guarantee around that they won't be identified, we've already breached that guarantee. So I think what we need to look at is basically considering we're clearer with participants about what we call reducing the risk of re-identification. And that's what we focus on. So we talk about how we will put in place technical and organisational measures to when we come to sharing the research data. So, for example, there will be maybe access controls placed on that data. So it won't just be placed on a public open website. You, it will be behind a wall where people have to register and agree to, for example, not identify someone if they can within the data. And we also need to be aware at the moment of the changing nature of technology. So big data and the linkage of data is becoming uh, much more possible. And in the future, what we might have thought as, as anonymous data, we're actually going to find it could be then linked to other data and then it becomes re-identifiable. Uh, and that could be uh, potentially problematic. So again, it's about being clear with participants about how we're going to mitigate these risks and what we're going to do. The other thing that we've noticed is around the placing of the data subjects privacy, so the participants themselves at the centre of any research project. Um, I think for us as research researchers, this really, I don't think this changes too much because we've always focused on protecting participants and having their rights at the centre of the projects that we undertake. Uh, I think what has happened is it's given us the opportunity to be perhaps more transparent and clear with participants about their rights, 
because of the, the need to inform them about their rights now and how we process their data, and also given us the opportunity to think about where we're storing that data and what we might be doing, and who owns the data, for example. Uh, another thing that we've also seen is the use of uh, privacy impact assessments or data protection impact assessments. So these are now required under certain circumstances. So one being an example would be where there's a high risk to the rights of the data subjects. We're actually seeing more interest just generally from researchers in asking sort of certain questions when they're undertaking this, like how can we protect participants? How do we uh, better anonymize the data or de-identify it? And in essence, it feels like in some cases, research is already starting to perform like mini privacy impact assessments, which is a really good step forward taking these considerations in when they don't actually have to perform a full data protection impact assessment. It's also allowed uh, researchers to think again about the security and the storage of the personal data and also the research data when it's collected. So, for example, we had more queries coming in at the archive around where data should be stored. For example, the cloud, personal computers, uni servers how it's stored, whether it needs to be encrypted, how it's protected and then backed up, and where to, who should have access to that information. And in particular also, one of the big concerns we saw was around um, data destruction. And destruction is one where we do need to be careful, um, because I have had some cases where people contact me and said, well, we have to destroy all, all research data after X amount of years. And this just isn't the case. We need to distinguish here between, say, anonymized or what we'll call the research data, which has had some level of anonymity put to it, and then the personal data, which we might be using to recontact participants, which we don't no longer need. That information, which we don't no longer need, that could be destroyed. The research data itself, that can be protected. And in fact, that can actually be kept indefinitely as long as we meet the requirements within Article 89 that we talked about on the previous slides. And uh, the ICO in the UK, so they're the enforcement agency here, have actually been very clear that for if it's collected for research purposes and you meet those requirements within Article 89, you can actually keep the data indefinitely, and that information is available on their website. I'm picking up again around this providing greater transparency and clarity to participants. We've seen that the information sheets and consent form now need to provide certain information on there, which is required under Article 15. And that information is now being kind of provided and given participants more information about who the data controller is and what the processing ground is that's being used. It also is very important, particularly around clarifying data subject rights, so what rights they have. And particularly if you, for example, in the UK using um, public tasks, you need to be clear to participants if you are going to strip away rights, what rights you're stripping away from them and what that will mean for them. Who is the data controller? So it's given us an opportunity again within the UK to highlight that actually this typically won't be the researchers, the data controller, it'll actually be the institute or university that they work for, uh, given the complexities that if it was the researcher and they were working in a, a multi-pronged project with other researchers, they would need, for example, data sharing agreements in place, etc. Whereas if you're all under one employer, you don't. And it's also been really useful because it's given us an opportunity to highlight the importance of data sharing and archiving when we actually collect the, the research data because of this transparency agenda and putting the information on the consent and information sheet. Okay, so that's everything from me on the changes to the UK. Okay, thank you, Scott. I uh, will take over and talk a little bit about Germany then. Uh, first, let me say that uh, mine is the perspective of a data service provider, and I will not go into details too much on handling personal data. What happened in Germany last year was that there was something that I would call a great commotion. So there were great uncertainties about the content and uh, the transition to new regulations. Could we just continue the way we've done so far over like almost 40 years? Do we have to change everything? And the main reason was, of course, the structure of the GDPR. But one expert in the field, Niklaus Forgo, today at the University of Vienna, formerly data protection officer at the University of Hanover, said that if you've been used to German data protection legislation, there's not much change. So uh, a lot of uh, regular ideas from German regulations have moved it, have been moved up one level to the European uh, level, so to say. But there are still things that people are struggling with uh, in institutions, for example, privacy by design, privacy by default, if this uh, is in anywhere uh, relevant to research, especially uh, if it comes to social media data or internet-based data, uh, how do you handle privacy breach notifications? So in case you do um, handle personal data and research projects, 
how do you do this? How do you inform the data protection officer uh, in charge and so on? And something that really scared people were uh, the sanctions, which I mentioned in, in Article 79 and Article 83. So all of a sudden, uh, researchers might be facing fines in a six-digit euro uh, level that was really new to a lot of people. So uh, a lot of researchers wanted to make sure that they are on the safe side and there's still intense discussion in various networks. And uh, the next slide, let me see. The next slide touches on anonymization, so somehow connects to what Scott has talked about. And anonymization has been at the core of scientific activities and human subject research in Germany for like 40 years now. And uh, the, uh, at the, ma the main concept was what we called factual anonymity. This comes from a federal constitutional court ruling in 1983. And the core idea was risk minimization. So the federal constitutional court in Germany said uh, concerning uh, a, con a census in Germany that had to take place that there was no uh, new data or the data, uh, any kind of data could be used against the person, the proprietor uh, of the data. And the factual anonymity uh, concept made it into German legislation, and I've put down uh, the paragraph here. And there was a distinction in German law between absolute anonymity, so there could not be made any connection to the person behind the data anymore. And the other one was that the attribution of data to individual would be, require a disproportionate amount of time, expense, and effort. So it's, a, uh, it's clear that this is a, a relative concept, but it's interesting probably uh, that this also appears in European Court of Justice ruling and the publications of the Article 23 group. So you can read the GDPR in this way because the term anonymous only uh, shows up in one sentence basically in Rosado 26, and, but clarification uh, was needed for working with data and human subject research. And talking for the German social science community, the German Data Forum, which is the association of data infrastructure stakeholders like Gezes itself or uh, the German uh, statistical office took a stance and said like, we will continue with the concept of factual anonymity because absolute anonymity doesn't really work for us. And if you take uh, the definition of pseudonymization and you uh, firmly delete every direct identifier and you reduce the information content of the data, you might arrive at anonymous data. Other issues that uh, were discussed, like general issues, all of a sudden people had problems with email lists and holding uh, names and contact addresses uh, for various purposes. Um, that is uh, in the work context. Uh, one thing that's probably uh, concerns only Germany, there was uh, the fear of possible dissuasions with costs by lawyers for unclear and incomplete data protection statements. Uh, according to German law, uh, private lawyers and law firms can fine individuals or institutions for uh, not complying with data protection regulations, especially for not putting a proper data protection statement on their websites. Uh, up to several thousand euros. And uh, talking about international research that we are involved in, so um, especially uh, data exchange within or beyond the European Union, uh, we still do this for scientific purposes, so we still pass on data that we consider anonymous to uh, researchers outside the EU. Um, what happened also is that more explicit consent forms were needed uh, covering also data archiving, a uh, topic that Scott also uh, talked about, that all of a sudden research projects were now also facing uh, the need to archive their data. Um, they are, this is enforced, for example, by the Federal Ministry of Research. They now have to uh, introduce phrases or sentences on data archiving, uh, always being of kind of afraid that uh, subjects, or humans that uh, research on, might uh, refuse to participate. This is really still a major issue. How long do you make the consent form, for example? Um, there is more involvement of data protection offices uh, from universities or other institutions. So handling data in the data archive or in other um, research data centers has become more tedious. All of a sudden, you really have to make sure or you have to really have to prove uh, 
that you're handling data in a proper way and according to data protection regulations. And uh, a somewhat odd uh, topic is still pending, that's the discussion of handling personal data from authors or primary investigators in citations, etc. I mentioned this here because that was also one of the questions that was posed to us as a panel. Uh, I say it's somewhat odd because it's good uh, scientific practice to have your name attached to a research uh, result, but then of course you might be thinking of cases of, of fraud and uh, maybe you don't want your name to be attached to a project that was found to present fraudulent or false results. Uh, but that's a very specific thing and it's still, as I say, it's still pending. We look at uh, data protection and cases. So we do see more and more requests by research projects um, that demand consultation on data or privacy protection there is a, uh, an increased level of awareness all around. Although Germany was the first country to pass a data protection law in 1974 and a federal protection law in 78, so people should have been used to this, but uh, as I said, there was a lot of commotion and a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we had to adopt our uh, consent forms, uh, as I mentioned before, for example, uh, for the German General Social Survey, the ELBUS that uh, Gieses is doing. Um, we are now demanding proof of informed consent from cooperation partners, international survey programs, for example, the European Valley Study. So before that, uh, everybody relied on good uh, scientific practice, but even within Europe, I'm not talking about the EU, but for example, Switzerland doesn't have a written consent or obligation for written consent. So uh, there's variation still, and but we uh, document that consent was uh, given by uh, humans who participate in the surveys. Then uh, handling pseudomized data by cooperation partners and international survey programs. So all of a sudden we're facing the fact that, and Scott has touched on this before, as long as direct identifiers are still available, pseudonymized data is considered personal data. So even if addresses are stored in a different country and uh, let's say the survey data, the anonymized or pseudonymized survey data is passed on to Gieses in Germany, there can still be made a connection. And so we have to uh, handle this in a very uh, sensitive and um, secure way. And what's still spending, stand, uh, pending in Germany is uh, the matter of data protection impact assessment where there are no fixed rules yet. Thank you, that was it from Germany. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, my name is Anna Mette and I will uh, talk about the uh, Norway case and the experience in Norway. Uh, at NST, my job is to assess projects and provide advice and training to researchers and students and have done this uh, before GDPR and after GDPR. Um, the data protection service at NSD provides assessment of research projects in Norway that has process personal data. And for 2019, the number of projects will be close to 10,000. And some of these are projects that need a data protection impact assessment. And I will, of course, talk about that a bit later. Uh, so the GDPR has resulted in a growth in the number of projects project that we have to assess and the number of requests for advice and trainings is very large. Researchers in Norway find it even more difficult than before to gain consent in the correct way. Um, and another change is that voice is now considered personal data after the GDPR, which means that researchers need an assessment even if the voice is the only identifiable information they have. As an archive, we hope that the new regulation will allow us to archive and reuse data more easily, as uh, Scott talked about the uh, um, reuse and archive exemption in the GDPR. Before the GDPR, oral information and oral consent was practiced in uh, the qualitative studies, for example, in fieldwork. It was sufficient to give information and the data subject gave consent indirectly or silently by participating. After GDPR, all consent has to be recorded or documented in another way uh, and silent consent is not longer allowed. 
Um, we have made new information sheet template that will contain new and mandatory information. Uh, the template will ensure consent as a legal basis, but the researchers find it difficult to use, especially in these qualitative studies. When it is impossible to ensure consent recorded in written document or with electronic signature in qualitative research, the other legal basis will be used. Consent is the legal basis for most research in Norway. This is different from Finland, Sweden and Denmark, where legal basis for processing personal data more often is public interest. In Norway, public interest is most commonly used as a legal basis for data collected on the internet, data from public registries, or data collected in uh, fieldworks. Uh, the age for consent is regulated in national legislation. In Norway, the Personal Data Act and Health Laws states 18 years or 16 years. Some cases, younger children can give their consent without the parents' uh, consent. And I'm not to talking about consent as the legal basis for processing data from children. Uh, from the researcher's point of view, this is diff it is difficult to gain consent because parents often do not respond to requests to participation. Participation. It is difficult to document consent because, and both parents have to give their consent. And in the GDPR, children are considered vulnerable uh, participants, and it often requires a data protection impact assessment. And this will uh, mean more um, time to use and more bureaucracy for the researcher. Okay, the data protection impact assessment. Uh, I will talk a bit about how we do this in Norway. The article 35 defines when the GDPR data protection input assessment is required and what it should contain and who will implement it. This is a new obligation with the GDPR and it ensures safeguards for the registered. Uh, often it, when it's likely to result in high risk for, and the rights of freedom of, of persons. And the controller will therefore seek advice uh, of the data protection officer when carrying out a uh, data protection impact assessment. For Norway, we have uh, our, uh, we have uh, made this uh, um, we have this uh, system where NST performed a data protection impact assessment based on the research notification uh, that the research will uh, send to us. We perform it based on a template that ensures that all relevant elements is included. We have done this uh, for more than 100 projects. And when it's, uh, it's performed, uh, it will be formally approved by the institution, uh, the data controller, and the local data protection officer. And when it's more than one data controller, uh, all has, have to uh, approve uh, the, the data protection impact assessment. Okay, I will now uh, leave this to Netherlands. Thank you. So, um, a perspective from uh, from uh, the Netherlands. Um, so the legislation changed, but if you look closely, uh, not much actually changed. And uh, as I think in most countries, the real change was not to be compliant, but to demonstrate compliance, which means uh, some form of uh, evidence and proof, and 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 thus some form of uh, administration. Um, then. Um, what we see is that um, uh, people in, in, in collaboration in the Netherlands are working uh, uh, to establish some, some clarity on specific topics. So uh, data stewardship, um, pseudonymization, anonymization, uh, uh, a safe environment to, uh, to collaborate, and, and also um, conflicting policies and how to help researchers um, find tactics to uh, to um, to not fall into these traps. Um, another thing is that uh, research is also uh, uh, 
a form a, 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 a chain of uh, processing personal data and should be in any way or other uh, be recorded in the um, register of processings and the thing is um, there's a there's, there was a lot of debate on on this aspect the thing is you don't need to I think you don't need to um, record ev every individual uh, research project and and thus um, the uh, um, well the the need for looking at categories of research and in in terms of the GDPR was uh, was relevant so you see uh, a focus on what are um, in terms of the GDPR relevant uh, scenarios in which you could say okay I'm I'm in scenario A B or C and and uh, this scenario is already uh, uh, in the in the uh, register of processings. These are the typical risks. These are the typ typical uh, countermeasures, and these are the legal documents you, um, you you should use. And these are the, and so on, and the data classification and all these aspects. And and this is an interesting approach, I think, because um, it gives the researcher an overview from the start. What what uh, what what are the things? What are the legal documents you need to use? What is the data classification? What are the measures I should take? And it is scalable because it it, um, it you you think of of common uh, aspects and common solutions, and then you have more time to 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 look at uh, the really tailored uh, research projects uh, approaches. So this are this is an example of looking at individual research aspects where you look at um, the the nature of the data. Is it personal data or special categories of personal data? Is it further processing of the or data collection? For obvious reasons, this is in a this is a is a is a, a good point to to uh, raise. And then uh, the geographical aspects: is it inside or outside the uh, European area? And this would be a comparable set of uh, uh, scenarios for collaborative research, um, which which will have the same effect for the for the for the principal investigator. Um, another thing we have been working quite a long time on is the, um, the National Code of Conduct for Processing Personal Data in, in uh, Research. And um, to be honest, uh, there's a, there's a de debate, uh, should it be a legal document or a practical document? And I think to be, um, to be uh, really helpful for researchers, it should be a practical document. And we are finding ways to um, to uh, uh, to distinguish the one from the other, uh, and and uh, uh, have have a practical document for for uh, researchers to use. What we also see is that there's um, uh, uh, national training programs by the uh, LCRDM, which I showed earlier, the the, the national platform for data. Uh, research data management, but also from from this uh, platform, the Research Data Netherlands, um, the data, uh, the, the research support uh, staff is being trained, uh, uh, and and one of the aspects is also the the, the privacy, but also the in, uh, intellectual property uh, aspects and so on. Oh, one last point. I think um, uh, we have we have a, a group of uh, DPOs, a network of DPOs, organized by our umbrella organization, the VZNU, and we have uh, uh, regularly, but not too often, uh, meetings with our data protection authority. And this is interesting because we can give context about our way of working and and the other way around. So that was um, a, a high level. Overview from uh, from the Netherlands. Thank you very much, panel. We'll then progress um, and go on with the questions. Um, what you see on screen is the various questions that were already submitted to us in advance when people registered. So we'll start with those. Any other questions that you have? Um, put them in the question box and we'll also deal with them. We'll continue with this for another 45 minutes normally, so there should be plenty of time to answer your questions.
I'm going to ask Anna Mehta to respond to that first question on the screen. How are DPIAs, so data protection impact assessments for research being Im implemented across different institutions for research? Thank you. I will not say I'm an expert on this, but I will talk uh, about the Norway experiences. Uh, if this is a collaboration with shared responsibility between the research institutions, the institutions may agree to implement the DPIA as they have been done by one of the, as, uh, <laughs> that has been done by one of the institutions. So this means that one institution will contact us to uh, carry out this uh, DPEA, and then the other uh, the other um, collaborative institution will then also um, implement them. Um, so the problems you may face if is if you plan to implement uh, DPEAs in different countries, uh, there could be some problems in uh, different policies on data security, uh, on ownership of the data, different understandings on how to gain consent, and different understanding on which legal basis to use. Okay. Thank you, Anna Mette. And the next question is for Marlon, I think. What is the applicability of legitimate interests in research using artificial intelligence? Yeah, so um, at, at, the way I look at this question is that, that uh, art, the use of artificial intelligence is, is a form of processing personal data and there are a, a specific form and uh, legitimate interest is, is, is a, is, could be a ground. What I think is, is more interesting perhaps to say is that Recently, um, the, the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence have uh, provided uh, two interesting documents, ethics guidelines for trustworthy artificial intelligence, and uh, very recently, I think yesterday, the policy and investment recommendations for trustworthy artificial intelligence. So I think the legal ground is indeed a good, uh, a good place to uh, start and, and a relevant uh, 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 question to, uh, to raise. But um, there is so much more related to the topic of uh, artificial intelligence. And what I really like is the framework the, uh, the high-level expert group uh, provided and the platform to collaborate uh, and implement this uh, uh, framework. Um, there's, there's not enough time to go into that uh, in more detail, but um, I think to answer the question, uh, legitimate interest could be a good uh, uh, legal ground for applying artificial intelligence, but there's a whole uh, a larger discussion, and there's now a framework and, and um, recommendations to do so. Thank you, Marlon. Um, next question, which I think Scott should be able to answer. What constitutes a data transfer? For example, a researcher bringing an electronic device across a border to a third country, publication on the web. Thanks, Erla. Yeah, so what constitutes a data transfer? Um, so, for example, uh, if we were to send an email with personal data in, which went from the UK over to the US, that would be a personal data transfer. Uh, it's also possible that a researcher that's bringing an electronic device abort, across a border, now assuming that electronic device itself uh, had personal data on, um, then yes, that it's potential that could be a transfer, uh, depending on, again, what they were going to do with that data, whether they were going to pass it on to someone else or use it themselves. Even publication on the web is potentially a transfer, depending on where it's stored on the web, whether you mean it's a, an area that only certain people can access it from a certain group, um, or if you mean that it's going to be openly published on the web. Um, so there's a variety of considerations there and depending on the context, but it is possible, yes, for an electronic device which crosses a border that has personal data to be classified as a transfer potentially. Thank you, Scott. Uh, the next question I'll um, ask Oliver to respond to. How can we deal properly with GDPR in the context of open data? For example, if we publish data that is enriched with metadata that may contain or would contain personal data? Yeah, thank you. This is an, an interesting question because we are facing this discussion on open data in the context of open access or open science, uh, but it's immediately clear probably that open access principles do not apply when we talk about 
the data gathered from humans, uh, human subject research. So uh, the motto here should be um, that the data should be as open as possible and as close as necessary. So uh, a demand, a public, a political demand for open access to data cannot mean that individual rights which are granted in constitutions and, for example, the European Charter of uh, Personal Rights can be overruled. So we have to strike a balance here and I think the motto just mentioned is the proper one. So you always have to watch out. So the demand of, for example, then citizen science also uh, getting access to this kind of data gathered from humans, uh, from individuals, uh, that's a tricky one. But uh, as I said, uh, there's a balance you can use. Thank you, Oliver. A next question. Um, can a public authority transfer personal data to a country outside the EU for research purposes with, con with a consent? Anna Meta? Thank you. Um, I hope I understand this question correctly because I would say yes. Um, as I, I thought it was, uh, the answer was yes all the time, and now I'm thinking if I, it's something I didn't understand here. But of course, you can use le the legal ground for transferring personal data could be consent, uh, and I think it's uh, it's the best way to secure uh, that um, the rights of of the data subject is to to get the consent when you are going to transfer personal data outside of the country, outside of the EU also. So the answer is yes. Okay, thank you, Anna Meta. Um, next question, and I'll ask Oliver to respond to that. How can we make non-sensitive archived scientific data that contain digital object identifiers, typically used for citation, containing authors' names? How can we make those GDPR compliant? Yeah, I've uh, touched upon this question somehow in, in, on my slides. Uh, that's a tricky one because, as I said, like it, usually it's good scientific practice and you want to be named uh, alongside results that you are responsible for, or you even have to. Uh, but then, yes, as I said, uh, if there are cases of fraudulent uh, research results, you might want your name detached. But that touches more on uh, liability and uh, other legal aspects that probably doesn't have too much to do with data protection in the first place. Because if you are responsible for a research result, uh, your name is on the list anyway. But now talking about, uh, let's say, long tail data, so um, uh, programs, applications, harvesting data, and then putting even metadata uh, at this higher level uh, in new contexts that might cause a problem. But I think there's no real answer to this yet. Uh, it, I would say that within a research context, it should be made clear before the data is published, before the data is released, for example, to a research data center or data archive, that all people who are deemed scientific advisors, primary investigators, researchers on the project are asked once, is it okay to release your name with the results uh, and then to document it somewhere? Because once the, this information is out, it's hard, if not impossible, to trace it. Thank you, Oliver. Um, next question, um, and I'll ask Scott to respond to that. Does the GDPR apply to personal data collected outside the European economic area and transfer to the EEA for analysis? Yes, that's a good question. It's very likely that, yes, it would, um, because it would then be classified as personal data once it's stored within the um, European economic area. So, yes, I think it would in that situation. But presumably we need to keep in mind there that the EEA is not the same as the EU. Uh, uh, is my understanding correct that GDPR only applies to the EU? So those countries that are not EU wouldn't apply? Yeah, that's correct. So if they're not yeah. an EU country, it wouldn't apply. But yeah. it would, it would, if they were within the EU or were a member state, yeah, that would, that would be captured. Yeah, because there's a few areas in the EA 
countries that aren't in the EU, Iceland, for example. I think. Next question. Um, I'll ask Marlon whether he can respond to that one. Is a DPIA required in scientific research only by assessing sensitive data concerning vulnerable subjects? Yes, yeah, so um, I, I wanted to, to add another uh, aspect about the D D DPIA. Sometimes it is required and, uh, and uh, in case of uh, a possible high risk and there's a by the, uh, the Working Party 29, there's a list of high-risk indicators, and when you have two of these criteria, you should uh, regard the processing as high-risk. But um, I think the the DPI is also a great way to for for for, uh, uh, for learning. Um, if you do a multi-stakeholder uh, session with so with a researcher, a legal person, and a technical person, for, for instance. Um, there's much to be learned in in that in that session. As sometimes it takes an hour, but um, the, the the technical people understand more. I think the the, the requirements from the for, for the researcher, what the specific context is, is also able to uh, con contribute to technical measures, uh, uh, adequate uh, uh, technical measures. And um, same goes for the for the for the legal uh, advisor. Uh, um, uh, when the when this person does want to establish what, uh, how are things possible and not just um, uh, establish that there is a form of risk and 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 the processing cannot take place. So, I think in some cases the DPI, if if there's a high risk uh, processing and there's criteria for this, then as, as, such as uh, the the scope of the um, uh, the scope of the um, Processing the nature of the, the personal uh, the, the the nature of the personal data, uh, um, uh, the the state of uh, technology use is, is it enough the technology and all these all these aspects are are mentioned, and um, when you take this into account, you you can establish uh, the, the 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 likeliness of the the high risk processing, but. I think the point is that it is also good to do a DPI just to learn uh, each other's context and and be able to um, again to to be able to uh, define common uh, solutions and common problems and uh, and common and common uh, um, uh, risk mitigation uh, uh, measures. Thank you, Marlon. Um, over to the next question, which I'll ask Oliver to respond to. What are the implications for international partnerships? for research projects or data dissemination when non-EU countries are involved? Yeah, that's a big topic, um, which I'll touch upon uh, briefly in my uh, slides. I mean, you can see it as a race to the bottom or a race to the top, uh, as long as the data is then being uh, handled within the EU, you need to adhere to high standards. Um, what we do, uh, and I've mentioned the case of the European Value Study, is that we now uh, make it obligatory for all project partners to have, uh, well, privacy or data protection measures in place and that uh, consent is being given by all uh, subjects or people who participate in the research. Uh, it's probably very difficult from research area to research area. Uh, and what needs to be done afterwards if the data is being released is if we um, apply, for example, the, the measures that we would apply to German data and which we pass on to German users and anonymize the data appropriately, that would be a good starting point for all this. Um, or that the German, let's say you are a European research institution and you want to handle data uh, with your project partners. What's important is that users and the purposes of use uh, are being recorded. And uh, I mean, you won't find areas anywhere outside the EU with the same level of data and privacy protection as uh, the EU has. So you have to strike a middle ground. And of course, uh, the European partners could force the international partners to adhere to European standards. But that's difficult. Uh, but I think that a lot of the mechanisms, which are also explicated in the GDPR, are in place in a lot of areas in the world. I mean, you can set up a secure server. You can uh, 
uh, encrypt uh, data, you can pseudomize data appropriately. This can be learned by anybody anywhere in the world. And so um, this might lead to uh, actually a race to the top, uh, talking about scientific projects. And um, yeah, people can or institutions can learn from each other. Okay, thank you very much, Oliver. Um, now a few very practical um, research questions of scenarios. And for the first one, I'll ask Marlon to respond. So I'm a Dutch PhD student. Interviewing Syrian refugees, I have settled in Italy, Germany, the UK, Norway, and the Netherlands about their experiences in migrating from Syria and settling into their new home countries. I'm using consent forms that record interview names. I will also keep people's names and contact details so I can interview them again in two years' time. I audio record interviews and then transcribe them. Who is in this case the data controller and the data processor? What would be the best legal ground for processing these personal data? And should I do a data protection impact assessment? How? Yeah, this is a good question. And, and, and uh, I, think, I think this is, the, this, this is also a very common question. Um, there's, there's usually very interesting uh, types of research done, and it, 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 it involves uh, um, uh, collaboration in some form, uh, geographical aspects, uh, uh, traveling, and and uh, all these questions related to how do you, how do you do this, uh, uh, yeah, safely and and uh, uh, according to the to the GDPR. So, in to, to start answering this, you need <laughs> support, I think. So, go to your uh, organization and see if if you can get some support by data stewards or by privacy officers. Or by some uh, some some entry point where you can get support, uh, because you you would definitely need some kind some kind of gu guidance. And it, I think it would start uh, indeed by uh, doing a data pr protection impact assessment, where you understand the the the, the logic of the GDPR, but also, uh, as I indicated, you 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 will be able to see from different. Um, uh, perspectives, uh, possible risk, but also possible solutions for for what you're going to do. One other thing, what happens to you during a data protection impact assessment is that you can zoom in or drill down to specific um, things you want to do. So, so it says here, I'm going to record. Is it recorded on a on a smart device? Will it be? Will the recording be on a on a cloud somewhere? All these all these. Uh, uh, underlying questions can also be addressed in the in in the data process in 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 the, in the, in this multi-stakeholder BPIA session, and I think that's that's very good because um, um, you will then get a more precise um, uh, view of what what exactly happens and what what the possible risks are, and thus what what you should communicate with your uh, with the the uh, the data subject. Um, uh, I think, in general, uh, 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 more is possible than, than most people think. Uh, but you really would do need to do stuff like you would really, really need to have a, a safe environment, probably end-to-end -end encrypted environment to store your data in. You would need some do some, need to do something like pseudonymization or not collect uh, the the uh, the data. So the data minimization principle: not collect the data you don't need. Um, and and make sure that when you travel and when you uh, um, uh, perhaps collaborate with other researchers, that there's a real uh, check on the on the, um, the the access to this data and the need to know basis for for this for this access, and and this is usually the tooling and the platforms available for this type of um, yeah well international collaboration is usually uh, a, 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 a well, uh, an issue, um, and uh, and 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 you should be really uh, be supported on on uh, on these aspects. So I think I think this is um, this is not very uh, uh, high risk. It is high risk, but it, it um, I think it's doable. But you need uh, you would need some guidance and help. Also in the the the, the forms and the legal documents, and you would be. The, as a principal in, in investigator, you will be the data controller. Um, the, so, one, one, perhaps one last sentence about the responsibility as a, as a researcher. Um, 
I think the your organization, uh, the, the the university, um, uh, has I think specifically in the in the Netherlands we have a, a three level uh, 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 type of of responsibility, where the executive board is the uh, in 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 the in the in the in the sense of the GDPR, um, the responsible uh, uh, part where the where the fines would would uh, be sent to, um, the because of specific legislation, the uh, uh, the, the deans in in the Netherlands, the wet and wetenschappen, the deans would be responsible within their faculty or uh, school for. Uh, uh, for for compliance, and and this would mean that the executive board would um, uh, would um, so the responsibility for the executive board would mean that they would have to um, make available policy uh, adequate support adequate infrastructure guidelines uh, and and so on, uh, and and the dean would then um, uh, uh, um, for for the typical type of research done at his or her uh, school or faculty would then um, do an assessment and see if additional measures would be necessary, and then the researcher um, would would be obliged to use um, uh, the infrastructure and the tools provided by the university and the, and follow the guidelines and follow the, the privacy principles as stated in the GDPR. And, and I think this it's good to, to look at it like this. So there is a responsibility at the researcher, but not all the responsibility, because the re researcher is not responsible for, for instance, the infrastructure. It's not, it's not, uh, and, and the, so, so things like multiple factor um, authentication, these, these are things that the university should, should uh, uh, provide. Uh, to, to make the, uh, to make, in, the, in this case, the researchers, uh, to make it uh, able for them to um, comply with the GDPR, so that's it's it's a bit longer uh, answer, but I think this is uh, this is a good way to approach this. Okay, thank you very much, Marlon. That's excellent. Um, next question, I'm going to ask Anna Meta to respond to. I'm a postdoc researcher doing a qualitative study interviewing women about abusive relationships. I will use pseudonyms for each woman interviewed. Respondents may still be identifiable from the story they tell. Does this constitute personal information? If so, which would be a good legal ground to use for this research? Thank you. Uh, I will just start by uh, talking. Uh, we were talking about the EU and the EU members. And as most of you know, Norway is not a member of the EU. And we still comply with the GDPR. So um, this means that the GDPR is implemented into the national legislation and this also means that we have to uh, follow the, um, the GDPR in uh, the research we will um, do in all over uh, Europe and of course in, in other countries. So <laughs> just I'm, I just had to clarify this. Thanks and for course, correcting me there, excellent. <laughs> yeah, but of course if maybe other non-EU countries have implemented the GDPR, I don't know really. So. So of course, um, if, if uh, yeah, so it, it could be worthwhile checking that out if, if you are collaborating with non-EU members uh, in the European uh, economic area. So Noah will answer the question. So uh, in this case, you can or you should gain consent from the women and the legal basis for processing the information will preferably be consent. Uh, there's one issue, and that is uh, information uh, about the other person in the relationship. Um, it, the man, the, the boyfriend or husband, or of course it could be another partner, uh, and you can probably not gain consent from this person. Still, he or she will also be identifiable in the data, so you will be processing information about people that you are not asking for consent. And that's a problem. So you have to, to argue that there is another legal basis for processing the information that, uh, that you have on other people, not the informant, but other people uh, that can be, be uh, named in the interview. Uh, in this case, I would say that uh, the legal basis uh, will be public interest. And that is, 
is if you can argue that uh, the project have great value for the society. And, um, still, you have to consider if it's possible to give the other person or persons information about you processing this data because that's one of the rights of the data subjects. Uh, in this particular case, <laughs> you can also argue that this will be impossible uh, because it might be dangerous for you as a researcher if this is a violent person or it could be dangerous for your in informant if the informant is still in the relationship or they live not far away from each other and people will of course need to um, um, talk together after uh, this kind of um, um, yeah this kind of relationship has ended. So uh, this is uh, a difficult uh, project um, and of course we we, um, we know a lot of uh, those. Uh, so that's, that's the Nor Norwegian um, perspective on this kind of uh, case and the solution that we will advise our researchers to, um, to uh, follow. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anna-Meta. And that last question on this slide, uh, I'm going to ask Scott to respond to. I'm doing an online poll survey using Qualtrics, asking 5,000 people across Europe for which political party they voted in the recent European elections, also recording their ethnicity and other demographic information. Does this qualify as processing special categories data? If so, how do I gain explicit consent for collecting this information? Hi, Verla, thank you. Yeah, um, so using consent as the processing ground there could be quite problematic because you it would be classified as special categories data and you'd then need to gain explicit consent. Now, one way that that could potentially be done would be to kind of do a double consent. So you gain the consent once at the beginning and gain consent again at the end of the questionnaire that's been asked. It depends how anonymous as well this poll survey will be, whatever information, information is being collected at the same time that can link to their identification. Um, it might be the case that you're recording um, so little personal information that broadly speaking you can't identify them, although you are collecting um, the way they voted uh, and their ethnicity, if the uh, study is wide enough that might not then be able to directly identify an individual, assuming you're not collecting, for example, the IP addresses as well at the same time. For me, this actually might be a case where using public tasks would perhaps be a better processing ground to undertake the study. And again, the, probably the best way to do this would be through a privacy impact assessment or a data protection impact assessment and looking at what information will be collected when they come online. Will you be able to pick up their IP addresses? Will you um, track from where they come from? Are you targeting specific people that you will then be able to identify uh, more easily? But if you're just capturing, say, broad information such as someone talks about their political party that they voted for and their ethnicity, but nothing drills you right down to, say, for example, where that individual lives or you can't then identify them from that, then that would be a level of anonymization. So, again, it should, it should help. Excellent. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, I'm going to pick a question that's just come in because the questions are streaming in. Um, and this uh, question, Pierre, I've seen it twice. Yeah. Pierre, could I just ask, uh, add uh, two sentences? Uh, yes, absolutely. On the, on the, on the, on the, yeah. yeah. So, um, one aspect of the question was using Qualtrics. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, I just have to, uh, I just wanted to reflect uh, on this. Uh, Qualtrics is a is a US based uh, uh, company and has, provides good services. And I wanted to illustrate that it took us, uh, our university, three years to have proper agreements with Qualtrics to be able to use it for this type of research uh, responsibly. And uh, the, the essence was that in the beginning, some, some three years ago, four years ago uh, now, um, uh, the GDPR was not very on the forefront of the company and the data processing was in, in, in the US. And, and to cut a long story short, after a long time of negotiations, now um, Qualtrics uh, accepts uh, the GDPR and a specific role within the GDPR for, for itself and uh, has agreed and now uh, effectively only processes data within uh, the EU, uh, uh, specifically in, somewhere in Germany, 
and 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 these conditions make uh, for us uh, make uh, uh, Qualtrics a tool we can use for for research purposes. Excellent, thank you, Marlon. And yes, I should tell my panel they're allowed to interrupt <laughs> if they have uh, something further to add. A question that I've seen twice have come in, which says, is scientific research in itself not a legal ground for processing personal data? Because of Article 9, legal ground for processing sensitive data. And it also reflects the first question on the screen. Why are some countries still using consent for research when there is a specific legal basis for research? Who wants to answer that question? Maybe Scott or Marlon? I can take a start to it. Um, so when we're talking about uh, the, I assume they're using the additional category uh, for processing. So when you're talking about special categories data, there is a ground there um, which allows you to use it, which is basically like um, is research itself, but you still have to have a ground under one of the other six grounds. So that's in addition to that for processing it. So what you could have, for example, is for processing the personal data, you might use public tasks as a processing ground, but to deal specifically with the special categories data, on top of that, there is a ground for research, but that would be an additional ground that you have to have. So you have to have the two together. I don't know whether Marlon might want to build upon this a bit more. Yeah, so, so uh, I think uh, I, I totally agree uh, with you. And I think just to give an example of where um, consent would not be the uh, the legal ground, um, but for instance, a, a public interest. Um, the the case of um, um, uh, well, the the case of research. I've, I forgot the term now. The case of research where you uh, are not able to tell the the the, the data subjects what what a real research question is because then they would. Uh, act in, uh, in, in, a, in a different way and not uh, have a natural response. And um, so, uh, asking consent would be uh, 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 disastrous for the for the for the research outcomes. And uh, for this for this purpose, um, you could uh, say, well, and, and, you, and, and suppose you want to process personal data and special categories of personal data. Uh, for for this, uh, th this was a, this was a case we we uh, we had, and and the way we went about it was that um, COVID research, that was a term, COVID research is allowed in certain uh, specific research areas in codes of conduct, and there are specific uh, um, uh, conditions for this. So, so, so when COVID research, for instance, in, 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 the, in, the, in the public interest is, is, uh, uh, is allowed, then you should do uh, things a bit differently in, in, in uh, you could um, engage a research project, but still um, consider the, the 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 risk, the privacy risk, and the freedoms of the of the data subjects, of the individuals, and uh, you should um, uh, be transparent afterwards, and 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 then uh, share uh, what the, the purpose of the of the research was, and share your findings with them, and in your publication or in your uh, 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 after your research, nev never disclose the information that is directly. Uh, uh, identifying uh, the individuals or or as a group, so there are some some good examples where where consent is not the 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 way to go because it will uh, affect the, the research findings themselves, um, uh, and but you still need a legal basis and um, I think this is a this is a broad misunderstanding and and uh, it's 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 good it's a good question. Um, and in most cases, you can fall back on uh, a public interest or a legitimate interest, and do, and do the balancing act uh, that 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 uh, is is uh, is part of that uh, that last legal basis. Could I okay. also um, fill in? Yes. I think for Norway's case is that we have um, practiced this consent as a legal basis for many years and it's difficult to think otherwise and what we think is that when you are in contact with people and you are asking them for uh, their permission to 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 collect information through interviews or through surveys and uh, doing field works observation uh, and all all of 
those kind of methods, it's it's easy to get the consent, and then you can use consent as a legal basis. And we also talk about um, the, the the ethical consent and the legal consent, and they don't differ that much. Um, the difference is that when you get the if to get to gain a le legal consent, you need to document the consent. And, and and it's not that diff different from from an ethical consent that you will you have to to uh, gain uh, to to have a good uh, research ethics uh, in, in, throughout your project. So so I will say that that is uh, the practice uh, we have in in Norway. But of course it will be difficult when doing some kinds of uh, studies like qualitative studies and studies when you are not collecting sensitive or special categories and of course when you are collecting data from from other sources than the participant uh, him or herself thank you thank you anameta i'm going to uh, ask oliver to respond to the third question here on the screen do source institutions such as data archives have a responsibility in researchers meeting their obligations under the GDPR? You, oh, I think we do. I think we do. Uh, bef until now, or until a number of years ago, uh, we were at the, let's say, end of the food chain, so very often confronted with research results, uh, and then cleaning up after a project. I mean, you have a lot of tasks to do. You have to publish uh, journal articles, present posters and other things at conferences and so on. And in the end, we sometimes, oh, we still have to do this. We're still doing this, clarify issues um, with research projects. Uh, but um, the obligation is that people come to the, we feel the obligation. And that is also true for other uh, data archives within the European SESTA network, uh, is that uh, a lot of research institutions uh, or research projects rely on us, among others, uh, to have the expertise on what, for example, anonymization actually means. Uh, and over the past years, SESTA and Gesis, um, as a minor, uh, as a partner in Germany, have uh, done loads of training on research data management uh, and legal and uh, ethical issues and uh, that were visited by hundreds of people, uh, uh, literally. And we see this obligation that I mean, to make our expertise all over Europe from all the data service providers, all those data archives, uh, to bring them to, to research projects. Because what we also see, one of the experiences is that usual project setting, uh, you have senior researchers overseeing the project but the actual work is being done by junior researchers, people who have just received their, their master's degree, who are pursuing a PhD project. They're all new to data processing. They're all new to all these obligations. And um, I think it's, well, it's more work on, on our side, on the data service provider side, but it's uh, worthwhile because it makes research better and makes it more transparent. And uh, people will have a better, virtually a better feeling and uh, they're more confident about their research results and those research results being passed on to data archives and other data uh, service providers. So yes, I see this obligations and this has been taken on by Gizes and other archives around Europe. Thank you very much, Oliver. Before we move on to these questions that have come in from, the, from, the, from our um, participants in the US. Um, I'm going to ask Scott to respond to that, but whilst he looks at the slide and the questions that are there, I have two very brief questions. Um, the first one still for Oliver, which was a feedback on his talk, say, asking, is it true that all German universities can count themselves as public bodies and therefore do not have to comply to GDPR rules and are not liable for any fines if there is non-compliance? This is a big problem for consortium agreements and joint projects with German partners. Well, that's a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a difficult one. Um, yes, universities are can be public institutions, but I don't see why they sh or would, uh, should not adhere to GDPR. I mean, they were the first um, 
institutions to be addressed by former uh, privacy protection legislation in Germany. And of course, universities and research projects at universities have to adhere to GDPR. They are not outside this. Oh, maybe I've misunderstood this question. Okay. Uh, they need to make sure that uh, to meet all obligations like consent, for example. Yeah, okay, thank you. We can also um, revisit those later on in, in writing. And there was a quick okay. question on Scott Stark, which I think I can respond to, but I'll just want to double check with him. It was just a question on the definitions about personal data, pseudonymized, anonymous data. Question, what is de-identified data? My understanding is that this is data where the direct identifiers have been removed only, correct? Or do you disagree, Scott? Yeah, I mean, that's the definition I would take, but I don't think there is a fully working definition, shall we say, for want of a better word. I'm not saying someone provide a very clear one, but I think that's that's the way I would interpret where you've removed at, at the very minimum the direct identifiers. Okay, so it's not recognised in GDPR that that is something that's enough to do? No. It's not a term uh, defined within it that I've seen, no. Okay. Uh, it's something that I think we've talked a little bit more about at the UK Data Archive and we've seen within the UK that term cropping up. Um, likewise in the UK you may have seen the term called functional anonymization which came out of a paper that um, uh, various people wrote and that again uh, is quite an interesting idea and talks around the principle of uh, where pseudonymized data might fit in with that. Um, I think the paper was published last year if I remember right. Okay, then I'll ask you now, Scott, to see what you can respond to the questions from the US. I'm not going to yeah. read them out. Yeah. No, so I'll try and kind of go through them uh, briefly, but with a little bit of information. So when we're talking here about pseudonymized data, if the key, if you don't have the key, as I mentioned earlier, in theory, and this is in theory, that would be classified to you as anonymous data. Um, the problem would be if that key was ever to be released into the wild or you were ever able to gain access to it, then that data would be pseudonymized data or could actually be completely personally, personally identifiable data because you'd have that linked key. I think it's probably, it would be an organizational decision, but treating it still as falling under the GDPR by its strict definition, you still need to comply with the GDPR. So yes, um, there are um, clauses which you might have to sign and agree to uh, through a controller processor agreement. So yes, that's possible. Um, it would be the risk that the uh, US organization wish to take there. Um, the right to be forgotten applied in research settings. So the thing I'd say here about that one is again, this is not an absolute right. It depends on certain circumstances. And again, one of the key things here was I would be looking to inform participants about this right that even if you uh, decide to give them this right or keep this right and you're not stripping it away, the problem you'll have is once you publish your research, if they are particularly identifiable in there, say they agree to have a quote given, you can't then pull back all of that research and pull back that um, paper or journal where it's been submitted or the book. So you have to be very clear with participants about what they can and can't do. So they might have the right to withdraw from the research up to X point. Then after that, the published findings, we won't be able to withdraw you. Uh, and again, this is where you might have that mishmash between consent, uh, ethical consent, and then using a different processing ground where you might then not have to remove them from the data. Um, the final one, a multi-site in which you complex only US. Um, so the GDPR would still apply to the processor within the EU, I think, when they collected the data or, or when the data came into them because it would be personal data. Uh, again, there's another one here about model clauses. Uh, there is a potential that you would need to sign a, a model clauses agreement and depending on the circumstances, if it's classified as personal data or even pseudonymized data, then it could. I don't know whether Marlon might have further bits to add to this as well, because I think we were discussing some of these before the for the pan panel. Uh, I think I think uh, I, I again <laughs> agree with 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 your. If if I may, I would also like to um, uh, uh, um, give an additional answer to the to the last question, the identification question, because uh, I, I, I think it's still uh, still relevant. So the, the GDPR doesn't say anything uh, specific or does not provide a, a definition on this, but there's an interesting uh, 
uh, uh, ISO standard, uh, which was uh, published in the, at the end of 2018, uh, privacy enhancing data de-identification de terminology and classification uh, techniques, which is really uh, an interesting uh, read also to understand practical uh, application of, of these uh, techniques. And, and, and there, is, there are definitions also uh, for uh, which, which I find uh, trustworthy, uh, also for the identification and all these um, uh, uh, terms. And the other thing, I, I think there's um, uh, people like Khaled Alamam uh, and from Privacy Analytics have, have, have provided a privacy de-identification de de framework that is, that is Far, uh, that is very interesting to look at if you if you want to to understand uh, all kinds of risks uh, related to the data, to re-identification risk and and the, the context risk and so on. It's a it's a very interesting uh, set of uh, reads and um, uh, um, uh, also very very practical in in the sense uh, what what do we need to do to de-identify and what are what are uh, what is pseudonymization what is weak and strong pseudonymization how is um, uh, um, uh, anonymization possible under what conditions and so on so there is a lot of interesting uh, frameworks and books and standards on on specifically de identification i think that's going to be very important in the in the in the near future thank you marlon i think a question that's come in now um that aligns with that was um have norway netherlands or germany developed any formal guides to pseudonymization that anyone is aware of in my panel no i think i think we're going to not not on a national level we, we are discussing on a national level in one of these working groups uh um, the aspect of uh, pseudonymization and uh, and and, de 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 and, and uh, uh, anonymization. I think I think we the the group working on this uh, on on these on this uh, uh, on on these uh, recommendations are using the the framework I mentioned from from uh, privacy analytics. Uh, I, I think that that is one one of the 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 the, the, the current standards uh, today. Okay, thank you. Um, a practical can question. I just, um, yes. Can I just say do. something? Yeah, yeah, as an archive and uh, as a service provider, we, we have, of course, uh, some standards that we use internally, but of course, um, and of course, there are other uh, uh, archives that also have their standards, and we all know about them. So, but uh, we don't have a national standard, and we, I don't think we, we will have that. Uh, either in this year at least okay yeah. thank you okay maybe thank could, you okay maybe, maybe i could add a phrase for germany as well because it's this all i mean there cannot be any one formal guide for cinematization um but for example for the social sciences the german data forum is currently working on an updated guideline for this and uh, data service providers also have guidelines and the statistical office has its own policies on this. Okay, thank you, Oliver. A very quick practical question. Can biological data material be anonymous? That refers to DNA, etc. Well, maybe I can add to this briefly because mm -hmm. um, it it can be if it's a snippet uh, but uh, there have been publications I think in nature uh, two years three years ago the problem was that uh, the material itself or parts of the material if you just take it as it is it is anonymous but then uh, metadata kicks in and that was a problem uh, where researchers found connections of various snippets in various places that they could match, and then there were pseudo, uh, um, uh, nicknames or other identifying in information, uh, so context information attached to some of the snippets. And so they, with a uh, high degree of certainty, they were able to trace individuals. So uh, on the one hand, um, parts of your DNA are anonymous because you would need a database holding your entire DNA uh, to re-identify you, but uh, the metadata uh, is the spice here. 
that makes it problematic. Okay, thank you, Oliver. A uh, quick question. I think I might ask Anna Mehta, but she wants to respond to that. Is it possible to say whether countries are converging or diverging in their choice of basis for processing personal data across Europe, specifically when we look at consent, public task? Any view? Mm. Or is it too maybe early maybe one Scott here? knows more about this than me. Okay, Scott. <laughs> what is your feeling? Uh, we need to I revisit this in, in 10 years' time. <laughs> I, I think we will have to revisit it. It does seem that there mm -hmm. is a little bit of divergence, but there's also does seem to be ver there's some convergence in the sense that they're identifying that consent isn't always going to be the most appropriate ground. So that's that's quite interesting that we're seeing that, that people are realising that consent will not be appropriate in all circumstances. I think it's the approach each country is taking. I think this, the standard that um, Noi starts starting from is, OK, yeah, we'll look at using consent as the processing ground and work from there and out. Whereas the UK is basically just saying public task, everything, don't perform any assessment, don't consider whether it's appropriate or not, just just use public tasks. And a lot of universities that I spoke to are kind of going down that ground. And I, I think that can be worrying that there are probably business reasons why they're doing it. But it can be worrying when we've then got to consider participants' rights. I think what we'll see perhaps in the UK is at some point a recognition that this might not be um, appropriate in all circumstances. So where we start finding certain projects, uh, particularly collaborative ones uh, across the EU, where we might find that consent is uh, used or legitimate interests are used where it's more appropriate. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, next question, we're going to round up just now because I need to let my panel go. Um, there was a question on data archives, so I might Oliver to see what he says. Should data repositories, data archives be considered as data processors or data controllers? Is archiving research data on a project part of the original processing for the data or does it constitute a separate further processing? What do you do at phases? Mm, yeah, that's um, uh, that's a good question. And what we do at Gezes is uh, we negotiate with research research projects first. Uh, there are uh, different stances. Uh, for example, um, the the Finnish data archive uh, has a provision that they treat all incoming data as uh, personal data first, so it comes into a kind of enclave. And then they make sure that there's no there are no direct identifiers attached and so on, and then they sign an, an agreement. Uh, the British Data Archive UKDA has uh, uh, two levels. So if uh, it's clear from the beginning that the data is pseudonymized or anonymized, uh, the data coming in, then uh, UKDA doesn't become a uh, data controller. Um, and this is a status we want to avoid at Gezes um, because, of, of course, this would mean, would mean that we share responsibility and uh, we have to have stricter measures in place. We are about to um, introduce these because we see more and more like, sensitive data coming in, but it all depends on what the data uh, is being passed on or being published via um, um, a data archive. And that is, I mean, you have to look at the GDPR as well. Um, or in German data law, it says then that data should be anonymized as soon as the purpose uh, allows for it. So um, you cannot freely distribute any type of data that you've collected with a new research project. But it also all depends. And there are various uh, models being run by data archives. OK, thank you. Anameta or Scott, do you want to? Add anything to that or in agreement? Uh, I can just say for NSD that we will archive personal data if there's a legal basis for it. And we will also check the data before we archive it. So, and of course, we, we have to anonymize it ourselves in many, many, many times. So that's the status. I'm not working at the archive, so I'm just um, giving some general information on it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And the last question I'll ask, social media data. How do we reconcile the right to privacy versus publicly available data when we want to use them for research? Who wants to answer that one? 
I can probably say something. This has been mm -hmm. a very, um, this has been a very uh, big question in Norway for the last five uh, years, I guess. And it's a lot of both ethical and legal aspects using uh, uh, social media data. And um, what in Norway we work uh, from the aspect of gaining consent as the main rule. Uh, both legal or, legal or ethical consent, and in some cases you can argue that you can use public task. Uh, but but in most cases we will try to advise the researchers to gain consent if that's possible. So that's just my thoughts on it, and I think that could be a webinar only on uh, using social media data. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Anna Meta. I think we'll um, finish the panel here and let the panel go and, and rest after we've run 10 minutes over. Just to our audience, who are still in full um, attendance there, um, we will write up the, all the questions you've submitted uh, with the answers. Um, any that we haven't been able to answer now, we will also um, write us up with responses and we'll publish that on the CESDA website, that is cesda.eu um, within the next few weeks. A recording of the webinar will also become available there, etc. Thank you all very, very much um, for um, the, the enormous interest. Thank you to my panel for um, answering all those questions and giving very clear explanations and I guess we'll have to revisit this in another year or so. Thank you.